Hello, my name is Vitor, and during this week of the gender and science subject, I've been studying the book Masculinities from Ray Wing Connell. And in this presentation, I'm going to summarize some of her main ideas and main concepts that she says in the book. But I would like to state that this is a summary and the only way to cover all, all her arguments and all her ideas would be to read the book. So I will, won't be able to cover all the details that she says in the book. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the author of the book, Masculinities, that is Ray Wincano. Uh, she's an Australian sociologist and she taught in the University of Sydney until 2014 and now she's retired. Uh, also, she's a trans woman and she completed her transition late in her life. So we can see several books from which masculinity is one of them that was signed with her previous name and from 2006 on she started signing with her actual name uh, Ray Wincano. Uh, also she wrote a lot about gender relations, about transsexualism and about education as well but she's mostly known in the society uh, by her theory of hegemonic masculinity that I will explain you later in this presentation and also uh, by her book Southern Theory that was published in 2007. The book Masculinities is the most cited book on researches of this field and we can see why, because he was firstly published in 1995, with his second edition being in 2005, with some additional commentaries, but maintaining the, the core of the book. And uh, the book is relevant because it is from a time where masculinity wasn't being studied or discussed in society and it accomplished a really hard task of structuring a whole gender theory uh, explaining why men and their relations in society are a part of the problem on gender inequality. Uh, also, a main concept that this, bring, this book brings is that there is no such thing as one unique masculinity. The book states that there are multiple masculinities that may vary across time, across culture, and across individual. And I will explain this theory moreover later. Uh, but what is interesting to see at, is that uh, the main concepts that this book brings are present in today's society discussions nowadays and also we can see that the book remains really actual. There is a great debate on whether masculinity should be studied and discussed in society or not. Some say, especially some minorities and some feminists, that uh, yeah, men and their practice, they generate the gender inequality, so there is a high risk in letting them into our agenda because they may do what they do with society and take the control and control the whole agenda for themselves. But there are some who say that yes, men are a part of the problem of gender inequality and this is why we should include them into the solution. Uh, this is why they should be a part of the solution as well and this is why we should include them into the discussions of masculinity uh, for them to realize all the harmful points that masculinity produces not only for society but for themselves as well. 
but before starting to explain Connell's ideas, I would like you to do this personal exercise. What do you think it is masculinity? What do you think that makes something masculine or feminine? What do you think is the definition of masculinity? Firstly, railing status that the concept for which we understand masculinity nowadays is a fairly new concept. Uh, it dates from the modern era, more specifically on the Western society. And since it is a new concept, she proposes four kind of approaches to define the masculinity and all of all four, four of them will be refused by Raven. So the first definition that she proposes is the essentialist definition. What they would try to describe for masculinity would be they would try to pick one feature of masculinity that would describe the whole masculinity. So they would pick this one feature and they would try to describe this whole masculinity around this core feature. Uh, as an example, she says Freud, for example, when he tried to describe the two genders, uh, he firstly assumed that the masculinity was linked to the activity and femininity would be linked to passivity. But later on, he, just, he realized that this whole definition was overly simplified and he dropped the idea. Uh, so the main problem of this definition for railing is that we can pick whatever feature we want to describe masculinity. Uh, we can see that from the many stereotypes that men have nowadays, like that men are leaders, they are rational, they are self-centered, but as well there are several uh, contradictory stereotypes for men. So, for example, we have the stereotype of men that is uh, self-centered and contained, but there is also the stereotype of men that are rebel and they are unor unorganized. So we can see that this feature for describing the whole masculinity is quite arbitrary, so it doesn't apply to defining masculinity. The second definition of masculinity for Connell would be the normative masculinity. Uh, in this normative definition, the masculinity would be defined as a social norm uh, for the behavior of men. So the whole society, the culture and the media would act like dictators of social standards of acceptable behavior of men. So in a way, uh, the normative definition and the essentialist definition are well linked because the normative definition can blend with some features defined by the essentialists. Uh, as we can see in several sex role models that we have that would stereotype, there are stereotypes of social standards of men that we have in our society. Uh, but Raywin would refuse this definition because she states that we cannot call something normative uh, as a social norm uh, in the moment that hardly anyone meets this norm. Uh, so in this way, it wouldn't be a norm because it's really hard for someone to reach these social standards. The third way of defining masculinity for Connor would be the positivist one. Uh, in this approach, the positivist would want to describe masculinity as it is, what men are actually. 
so they would perform a lot of surveys and questionnaires to uh, really describe and define statistically what are the main features that describe masculinity and what are the main features that describe femininity. But Connell also refuses this approach because uh, she criticizes it firstly because uh, it is assumed to be fairly neutral, but you are already taking assumptions since the beginning, uh, since when you are starting to create the questions to define what will be analyzed uh, for the differences between masculinity and femininity, you are already taking a lot of gender assumptions. So you cannot describe fully masculinity in a neutral way uh, if you are there already taking sides since the beginning. And at last, Connor would describe masculinity by the semiotic approach. Uh, semiotic uses a linguistic concept that is to describe, describe objects with base on symbolic differences. But in the case of masculinity, then uh, masculinity would be described as a complex symbol that is opposed to the feminine. Uh, which is masculinity would be everything that is non-feminine. And uh, in this sense, Connell says that this is the most coherent approach to describe masculinity, but as well, this lack a little bit of other complexities when analyzing masculinity, such as the relations of the people and the gender relations, uh, because semiotic takes only in account the symbols and the difference, the symbol differences between masculinity and femininity. It doesn't take account the gender, it doesn't take account the race or the class of the individual. So it would be limited in its scope. So to illustrate the idea of Connell for the masculinity definition, I took this excerpt from her book and I will read it so shortly and after try to interpret it. Uh, so masculinity to the extent the term can be briefly defined at all is simultaneously a place in gender relations, the practice through which men and women engage that place in gender, and the effects of these practices in bodily experience, personality, and culture. So uh, I found this excerpt really interesting because uh, we can see that Connell finds masculinity way more complex than the other definitions. Uh, we can see that she still maintains the semiotic approach of defining masculinity and femininity as two contradictory symbols, but she introduces another layer of complexity to the masculinity definition, that is the relations, the gender relations and how the, they may affect us in the personal life and how they may affect the culture. Uh, so this is what she will describe later. So Kona would say that in order to define masculinity, we should not focus on the differences of masculinity as a symbol, but rather we should focus on the relationships to which masculinity is linked. So uh, she elaborates this whole theory of gender. Uh, it's interesting to say that this theory was one of the first gender theories and it was really important at the time, but it doesn't uh, talk about transgender. Uh, it's a quite binary theory of gender, but it is still 
valid until today uh, because she has some interesting points on gender. So I will try to read the, this little excerpt from her book and I will try to interpret the, the point of view of gender for Connell. So gender is a way in which social practice is ordered. In gender processes, the everyday conduct of life is organized in relationship to a reproductive arena, defined by the bodily structures and processes of human reproduction. So, uh, what is interesting about Connell's gender theory is that she takes off the biological point of view of gender and she adds this new layer for gender that would be the social one. Uh, so, gender would be a way to structure our social relationships and social practice. And so, the gender would be a social pattern that not only is a product of all the history and culture in which we are in, but also produces these patterns, these social patterns. So, uh, since gender is a uh, configuration of human relationships and social relationships, uh, she would say that masculinity and femininity would also be a gender construction, would be gender practices that uh, are explored in, in the book, but she would say that masculinity cannot be understood without considering the gender layer. Gender layer. So uh, she would state, for example, that the, the state itself is a gender institution because the fact that there are more men in key positions of power is not only a consequence of the gender inequality of this gender structure, but also a product uh, uh, produces this, this gender structure. Uh, so in that way, gender would be a really complex field with a lot of interconnections between several subjects such as classes, such as race, such as etnology, and this is Connell's point of view. So, in order to better understand and comprehend this complex concept that is gender, Connell creates this whole theory on gender order that tries to comprehend gender within the, some relations that she describes that are power, production, emotional and symbolic uh, relations. And also she states that these relations are interconnected and they all have to be analyzed in order to comprehend the whole concept of gender. Uh, so the power relations, firstly, uh, is the most present relation in Western society nowadays, according to Connell. Uh, she says the power relations is uh, the relations that legitimize the dominance of men over women. So uh, this would be the relation that feminists would call nowadays as patriarchy. And uh, it is legitimized by several tools of uh, of the patriarchy, for example, the violence. The violence is a, a tool used by the patriarchy to maintain it, its hegemonic power over women. Second, she describes the production relations. The production relations are the gender division of labor, which is uh, if a man, he doesn't have to do the housework while you, his woman has, this is a production relation. Also, if a man gains, gains a higher salary than a woman in the same position, this is also a production relation. And she also states and elaborates that the cat capitalism economy that functions through this gendered division of labor, uh, it contributes to the accumulation process and contributes to generating inequalities. 
And for Ness, there is the Catixis uh, production. That is the is a term borrowed from Freud, and it tries to describe that the gender also controls our emotions and our uh, interests, our passions. So if we find something uh, prettier than other, this is a cathexis production uh, because the whole emo emotional attachment is a gender process. So, and at last in the image on the bottom right, we can see the symbolic production that would be the one that we already described in the previous slides. That would be the symbolic difference between masculinity and femininity. So in order to better understand the gender orders, Connell would create this theory over masculinities that would be the one of the main concepts of this book and it's one of the concepts that made her famous. So uh, she says that firstly that we cannot define one masculinity. There are several kinds of masculinity that may vary over time, over culture and over individual. Uh, so, in order to better describe these different kinds of masculinity, again, she proposes a relational approach and she would try to look into the relations among the masculinities. So, she creates these four kind of relations among masculinities and I would try to describe them right now. Uh, first, the first definition is the hegemonic masculinity. This kind of masculinity would be uh, the, the current accepted type of masculinity that is dominant over all others. Uh, this kind of masculinity would generally try to legitimize the, patri the patriarchy and the dominance of men over women. And also, this kind of masculinity would always want to maintain its status of power. So, one thing that she says that is interesting that is that the hegemonic masculinity is dynamic. So, it may vary over time and it may be challenged by other kinds of masculinity as well. Uh, this hegemonic masculinity is often sustained in power by several standards and which may be the cultural standards or even the institutional power. And it's needless to say that these bearers of this masculinity are the most powerful people in the world. And after the hegemony, she would describe the relation of subordination. That would be when there is a specific relation of dominance between a group of men and another group of subordinated men. So uh, usually the subordinated men are men that trace some kind of femininity, uh, such as the gay community that we can see that they are subordinated to heterosexual and patriarchal men in our nowadays societies. So they would suffer from political exclusion, from violence, not only physical violence, but also legal violence. They would suffer from economic discriminations and several other kinds of discriminations that would make them subordinated to the heterosexual patriarchal men. After that, she would describe the complicity relation. She would say that very few men completely meet the definition of hegemonic masculinity. And also many men may also have syndromes and social problems because of the normative culture of hegemonic masculinity. So she would rather describe them as complices because they still profit from being a man and they still profit from the patriarchal dividend of being a man. Uh, 
she would say that it's tempting to define this kind of man as a softer version of hegemonic masculinity, but she would also say that there is a lot of cooperation between the hegemonic masculinity and other kinds of masculinity as well that help hegemonic masculinity to maintain the control. And the last concept that Connell gives is the marginalization relation. She would say that masculinity is a gender category and therefore it should intersect with other relation systems as well, such as race and class. In this way, marginalization would occur when one kind of masculinity is oppressed by another and this other would generally be the hegemonic masculinity uh, but as well, this oppressed masculinity can also be empowered by the other masculinity. Uh, she would give it the example uh, of the dominance of white men over black men. So in this example, the black men would be marginalized, so they are oppressed by the black, by the white men, but uh, there are some examples of black athletes that are turned into models for justifying the hegemonic masculinity. So this is the marginalization. And at last, although we have all this patriarchal power and gender order, Connell says that there are some signs of elements that show a collapse in the patriarchal structure that we have today in society. Uh, we can see that the feminist movement is having more and more uh, followers and it's achieving more and more rights for women. So women, there are more women in position of power. There are more equality between men and women. Uh, we can see more sexual freedom uh, for, for all genders. So we can see the LGBTQIA movement that preaches the liberty of gender, of the gender structure and uh, also the Black Lives Matter movement that is currently, currently going on today that uh, questions the oppression suffered by the black people over white men. So, uh, in summary, Ray Wincano, she states us a lot of concepts that are actual until today and her whole theory on gender and on masculinities and the different kinds of masculinities can are present and actual in society until today. So thank you a lot for listening to this presentation. If you are interested in the subject, I will leave here two documentaries that address the masculinity subject on a discussion of nowadays societies, so they are really interesting and I really recommend them. And bye!